Good day, and welcome to the Senior Care Channel. My name is George Roach. I'm an elder law and estate planning attorney for over 35 years. And today, we're going to be talking a little bit about some basic estate planning that every one of you should be doing right now. Um, nobody has a crystal ball. You can't look into the future and say, hey, I'm never gonna come down with Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to suffer a stroke. My personal favorite, and I've heard it so many times, very simply, they're never putting me in a nursing home. Right? And as I said, nobody's got a crystal ball. A little planning today goes a long way. Uh, planning is simply taking the future, bringing it into the present so you can do something about it now. Um, older people say to me all the time over the career, uh, what should I be doing right now? I want to start tying up the loose ends. You, as you age, you cannot wait until something catastrophic happens. You have to take the bull by the horns now and do something about it. If you want to protect that nest egg that you've worked so hard to put together over the course of your lifetime. You don't want to see it go out the window to pay for the cost of long-term care. So you've got to do some basic planning. And it's very, very simple to do. Uh, not all that difficult. All right? It's the foundation upon which any good estate plan is built. There are four little documents that each and every one of us should have. Legal documents. All right? It's what I like to call a little legal checklist of documents. One, as you would expect, as most people are concerned about, is their last will. Last will and testament. But I can tell you, there is a heck of a lot more to putting your affairs in order than just having a last will. Hmm? While we're alive, well, and competent in this world, and we can make decisions for ourselves, in addition to a last will, you should also have a little document called a durable, with a D as in dog, durable power of attorney form, followed up by a health care proxy form, and lastly, backed up by a living will. You may be living well and not have a living will. These four documents, as I said before, comprise the foundation upon which any good estate plan is built. If you have these four, you can be sure and confident that, God forbid, one day it hits the fan. Something unforeseen happens. Stroke, Alzheimer's disease, a fall, an aneurysm. You've done the planning so that the people and the machinery are in place to protect that nest egg and keep this show running. To use a little baseball analogy, you've now put somebody in the on-deck circle who's able to come into this ball game and take over for you. Very, very important, and it, you can avoid a tremendous expense later on down the road where you don't have these documents. And we'll talk about a little bit about guardianship later on. But for the present, as I said, last will. First and foremost in the minds of most older people. Why should you have a will? Very simple. We spend our entire lives accumulating stuff. The personal property that you have, your house, your bank accounts, your stocks and bonds, the investments, the second home, the boat, the car, whatever you've put together through your hard efforts, that's your nest egg. You want to enjoy it. You want to hold on to it. You want to be able to pass it on, God forbid you pass away, but you also want to protect it, God forbid we need long-term care later on down the line. That's where that nest egg is really at risk, and really nobody gives a thought to that. Right? Everybody thinks they're going to live to the point where they're going to die in their sleep, as Kenny Rogers says in that song, The Gambler. But from my perspective, over the 35 years that I've been practicing in this field, as we age, uh, the wheels start to come off the bus, people get sick, they start to, to need long-term care either at home or in a nursing home, and if you don't do the planning, you can literally watch everything you own go out the window to pay for, that long -term, pay for the cost of that long-term care before you pass away. And there isn't anything to leave to your heirs. So the, you got to take the bull by the horns and do that planning now. All right? In the eventuality, nobody gets out of here alive. We all pass away at some point, which is why we all need a last will and testament. Why? 
having a last will, it's the last opportunity that you or I or anybody else is going to have while we're walking around breathing on the face of this earth. We get to decide who gets our property, our nest egg, who gets it after we're gone. You can actually reach out from the grave and say, you get it and you don't. All right? You can exclude people from sharing in your estate. Hmm? So that's the very important reason. It's the last opportunity you get. It's a basic, this is basic estate planning. All right? A lot of older people are very concerned about their wills, and of course you should be. All right? A lot of times people have a very old will. Hmm? They, had, they did it years ago. And now maybe the witnesses to that will are gone, the lawyer is gone, and we look at it and, and it isn't worth the paper it's printed on. So these documents that I spoke about, they should be reviewed every once in a while. Take a look at them, all right? How often? Rule of thumb. You have five fingers at least once every five years. Take your will out, blow the dust off it, and read through it, all right? And when you read through it, make sure some people are still around, all right? Who? You for one, make sure you're still here, all right? Number two, Make sure your spouse, your children, your heirs, the people who are going to inherit your property, hmm? make sure they're still around. Make sure your executor is still around. The executor is very simply the person you named in your will to run the show after you're gone, to follow your directions in the will. Simple as that. That's all that person is. Make sure your will provides for a substitute executor in case something happens to the first person. In those documents that I just mentioned, that's what we're doing, some very simple estate planning. We're saying, we choose A to act for me, but if something happens to A, then I want B to act for me. And sometimes even C, if something happens to B. We're always providing for an alternative. Hmm? Now, your wills, common misconception, wills are not notarized wills are witnessed. You need at least two witnesses to a will. One of the important reasons you probably go to a lawyer to have that will drawn up is that nine times out of ten, the lawyer and his or her staff, the secretary, the paralegals, they are going to be the witnesses to that will. The lawyer's name and address will appear on the back of the will. You never have a problem establishing that a lawyer drew up this will. And more importantly, when it comes to the witnesses, those people who witnessed your signature, the lawyer most likely will be using a little document called a witness affidavit. Very, very important. All an affidavit is, it's a sworn statement before a notary. What is the witness swearing to? Two things. Number one, they saw you sign it. And number two, you were competent when you sign that will. You knew it was your will, you knew these were the people you wanted to get your property. As long as those things are satisfied, those witness affidavits, by the way, go right in the back of the will, they get stapled to it, and they actually become part of the will itself. So God forbid, later on down the road, one or both of these witnesses vanishes, dies, predeceases you, becomes incompetent themselves, you have their witness affidavits that were signed at the same time the will was signed, and you're good to go. Your will can be probated. Hmm? Very, very important to have those witness affidavits. Nothing causes lawyers uh, who do estate planning and estate work more grief and more aggravation. They get, a, they get a hold of a very old will, and lo and behold, we can't find the witnesses. They're gone. There's no witness affidavits. I got news for you. If you can't find the witnesses to your will, and you don't have these witness affidavits, the will isn't worth the paper it's printed on. You're never going to be able to probate that will. All right. Why? Mm. You're deceased. It was your will. Unless you're Lazarus, and you could come back from the dead and say, yes, that was my will. All right. That's what those witnesses actually do for you. They come forward after you pass away, and they say they saw you sign it. All right? Very, very important. So if you're checking out your will, all right, one of the things you should be doing every once in a while, make sure you find your signature and make sure your will has the signatures of the two witnesses 
And if you had it done by a lawyer, make sure your will has those witness affidavits. That being the case, you can then fold that will back up, put it away, let it collect another five years worth of dust. The whole focus, gang, um, of good estate planning is to avoid probate, is to avoid ever having to use that will. I like to think of it as a backup document. There are other ways to leave your property so when you pass away, it goes to people, other people by operation of law. The most common form of ownership of property is what we call joint ownership. There's a right of survivorship. Husband and wife. Husband dies, the wife owns that property lock, stock, and barrel. Nobody's will had to be probated because there was a right of survivorship. She's the surviving spouse. It all goes to her. If she adds one or two of the children to the bank accounts and the wife passes away, that property will go to those children. By operation of law, nobody's will had to be probated. So if you're sitting out there in the audience and you're a husband and wife situation, you want to make sure you always provide for somebody else to come along so we don't have to probate that will. Put somebody on that bank account. And there are, there are other ways to do estate planning. We'll talk about them in another a segment or another time about using trusts all right, as an estate planning device. Sometimes we, when we're dealing with real property, we use a little thing called a life estate. We'll talk about that all right, sometimes if that's the situation. But that's pretty much the basics on a last will and testament. All right. Now, your will, think about this for a second, your will only goes into effect when? Hmm? When you die. And when is that? All right. A lot of people say, I don't want to know. But oddly enough, as soon as the doctor signs off on your death certificate, that's when you're officially gone from this picture. Not until then. So what does that mean to you and I? Because I'm in the same boat. They don't give me any special treatment. All those people that we named in our wills as our executor, our beneficiaries, our heirs, the people who are going to inherit all of your stuff, your nest egg, those people have no legal authority whatsoever to act on our behalf while we're alive. Hmm? While we're alive, well incompetent, who's in the driver's seat calling the shots as far as our nest egg is concerned? We are. We live and die by those decisions. It's under our control. We decide how our nest egg, such as it is, whatever you've saved up during the course of your lifetime, how that nest egg is going to be managed, saved, invested, given away, squandered, gambled away. We live and die by those decisions because we're in the driver's seat and we're calling the shots. So the question you have to ask yourself right now very simply is, what if I can no longer call the shots? What if I lose the ability to manage my legal and financial affairs. I lose that control. And think about it. It happens sometimes unexpectedly. Strokes, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, a fall down a flight of stairs. Any number of things can render you to the point where you can't manage your legal and financial affairs. So who's in the, who's in the on deck circle? Who's coming in this ball game? Who do you authorize? And that's where that second little document comes in. In my humble opinion, the durable power of attorney is probably the most important planning tool that each and every one of us, myself included, can do for ourselves today. Make sure you authorize somebody to handle your legal and financial affairs. Who would that be? Make sure it's somebody that you trust. All right. You have to be able to trust that person, a spouse, maybe a child, all right, because that's the bottom line with a durable power of attorney. You must be able to trust that person. I often say if you don't trust anybody, you're better off without it. But if there is somebody you trust, all right, a spouse, a family member, a brother or a sister, a trusted friend, hmm, then if you're competent, you can authorize them. Now we call that document a durable in quotes, a durable power of attorney. What do we mean by durable? 
All we mean by durable, very simply, is that it survives incompetence. For example, really simple, a husband and wife. Right? A husband gives his power of attorney to his wife. I often say, for two reasons. One, he knows what's good for him. Hmm? And number two, he trusts her. All right? So the husband authorizes his wife in this form. And then the form also provides for an alternate. All right? It is very flexible. In case something happens to his wife, maybe it's a, a child or two children as, as co-agents for him, very important that you always provide for an alternative. Hmm? Because again, nobody's got that crystal ball. So the husband authorizes his wife today. He's fine, he's competent, he is still gonna call the shots, he is still gonna act for himself. That durable power of attorney is really a planning tool. It is a what if tool. What if something happens to me? Then I want my wife to be in the driver's seat and vice versa. Hmm? Husband authorizes the wife in the durable power of attorney. He's fine. Five years down the road, he comes down with Alzheimer's disease. He doesn't even know who she is. Now, there's a strange woman downstairs, but she has my durable power of attorney. Okay. Now she is authorized to act for him. If he needs long-term care, she can sign his name to a deed, to a document. That's why it is very important to authorize a person to trust, because they will be dealing with your assets, with your nest egg, hopefully trying to protect it at some point in time. You've given them that authority. Now, if you're sitting out in the audience and you haven't done this, you haven't executed a durable power of attorney, to somebody that you trust, what happens, God forbid, you become incompetent, you lose the ability to manage your legal and financial affairs, and you haven't made a provision for it. Well, you're not dead, so the people in your will can't act for you. They only take over after you pass away. The only way, the only way you can legally act for someone without a durable power of attorney, in effect, is to be appointed their legal guardian, what we call legal guardianship proceedings. You actually have to go to court, hire a lawyer, spend a lot of money to get the same authority from the court that somebody could have given you with a durable power of attorney. So just from a financial perspective, go to your legal representative and have the durable power of attorney drawn up. It's a form. Uh, it used to be a very simple one-page form. There were some changes made a while ago, and now it is a multi-page form. All right. It's uh, a bit confusing if you've never seen it for the first time, but it is still very, very important to have. Make sure you have somebody with a durable power of attorney. Now, a couple things you have to know about this form. The durable power of attorney forms are state-specific. State-specific. Each state has its own form. So what I'm saying to you very simply, if you're sitting out there in the audience and you are truly fortunate enough to own out-of-state property, uh, you own a condo in Florida, you own a vacation home in Maine, you own a ski chalet in Vermont, uh, a beach house on Hatteras Island, a timeshare in Disney. I play my mega millions like everybody else. I buy my ticket, all right? We all have dreams, but if you own out-of-state property, make sure it's covered by an out-of-state durable power of attorney. Each state has its own form. And a lot of the states, they're very simple one-page forms. They haven't changed uh, like they have here in New York. But uh, make sure that out-of-state property is covered. It's critical. You can't sign a Florida deed using a New York power of attorney. You must have that Florida form. So even if you don't own out-of-state property, maybe mom and dad who retired to another state own out-of-state property. Make sure they do some planning. Authorize you, and it'll make your job a lot easier later on down the line, if necessary. Okay. Very, very important form. As I said, probably the most important planning tool each and every one of us can do for ourselves, and I, I really can't overemphasize that. Um, as we age, I spend a lot of my time uh, 
Now, in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living centers, people's homes, because they're, they're pretty much homebound, uh, trying to do these documents at the last minute. And it's, it's really kind of tragic because uh, a lot of these people are, are simply hanging in there by a thread. Uh, they've had a stroke, they fell down in a parking lot, they have traumatic brain injuries, any number of things. I always say, welcome to my world. And now they have to execute these, these, these documents. And as we know, as we age, and I, I've seen it myself, uh, as we age, our manual dexterity, the ability to sign your name, starts to go downhill. Throw in a little dementia, a little partial stroke, and then it is very difficult to execute these forms, to manually execute these forms. So do yourselves a favor. While you can still write your name and print your initials reasonably well, do it. Because I've seen cases where the, the person in the hospital bed is so weak from a stroke or a fall or an aneurysm that they can't even press the pen hard enough to the paper to get the ink out. All right, let alone see the print that's on the paper sometimes. So don't wind up in that situation. All right. Now, you have your will, covers you after you die. You have your durable power of attorney, which covers you while you're alive. Now, there are also some decisions we have to make concerning ourselves. And I'm talking about the last two documents, the healthcare proxy and the durable power uh, the healthcare proxy and the living will. Now, as we know, as, we, as competent adults, each and every one of us has the ability to make our own medical decisions. We decide what's in our best interests when it comes to our medical care. And when it comes to our medical care, we have a lot of choices, sometimes too many choices. But it's nice to have the ability to choose. Right? To say, I want this treatment, I don't want that treatment, I don't want that procedure, all right? We can make those decisions for ourselves when it comes to our medical care as long as we're competent. So the question again that you have to ask yourself very simply is, if I lose the ability to make my own medical decisions, who is going to make them for me? All right? Think about that for a second. I can tell you on a personal basis if I can no longer make my own medical decisions, I certainly don't want the medical community making them. I want to put my people in the driver's seat, the people who know what I want done when it comes to my medical care, especially when it comes to end of life decision making. It is crucial. It is critical. I cannot overemphasize that enough. You know and I know, it's no secret, the medical community will give you all the care in the world, whether you can pay for it or not. We expect it. The problem arises when somebody wants to step up to the plate and say, wait a minute, doctor, time out here. No, my wife didn't want that treatment. My grandmother didn't want that treatment. My child didn't want that treatment. You have to have the ability to say no to the medical community. Enough is enough. You have to put your people in the driver's seat. You have to have the ability to say no. Doctor, what part of no don't you understand? The N or the O? Enough is enough. Now how do you get the ability to say no? Very simply. You designate somebody as your healthcare agent in a healthcare proxy form and you simply back it up with a document called a living will. Now, the healthcare proxy. The healthcare proxy is good in all 50 states, US territories, and possessions. Why? Because Congress said so back in 1991. Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Patient Self Determination Act, which allowed the healthcare proxy to be recognized in all 50 states. All a healthcare proxy is, by definition, very simply, it is a medical power of attorney form. A medical power of attorney. What are you doing with the healthcare proxy? Again, 
You are giving somebody that you trust, there's that word again, you're giving somebody that you trust the ability to make your medical decisions, hopefully, hopefully, just like you would make them. Right? Which means what? The person you name as your healthcare proxy, do not take them for granted. You have to talk to that person. There has to be communication between you and your healthcare proxy. Let them know how you feel about certain things, especially about end of life decision making. I personally don't care how you phrase it. You let them know, look, if that's going to be the quality of my life, right? don't let them keep me alive like some kind of scientific experiment here. Please, disconnect this machinery, let this party come to an end. However you want to phrase it, most people that I speak to do not want to continue in that fashion. If that's your decision, then you simply have a healthcare proxy. The person you name as your healthcare proxy, you are giving them the legal authority to withhold life-sustaining treatment from you. You're giving them that authority under the law. So as the man in the movie says, choose wisely. All right? Uh, I run across situations all the time where a parent will relocate to another state, fill out that state's health care proxy, never talk to their children. The parent has a medical event, a stroke, winds up in a local hospital. The children will fly down. They'll be outside the hospital room. The doctor will say, all right, which one of you is the health care proxy? The proxy identifies himself. And then the doctor will say, well, what do you want done? And the child will be at a loss because mom never said what she wanted done. So you really have to talk and communicate to the person you want as your health care proxy. What does a health care proxy cover? A health care proxy covers anything you could conceivably think of as a medical decision. A to Z. If you start at A, unless the cloning people are not telling us about it, probably in vitro fertilization, right up through and including withholding life-sustaining treatment. That's included in the authority of the healthcare proxy. So let your proxy know how you feel. Now, you can only name one person as your primary proxy. You cannot name co-proxies. So choose the first primary proxy and there's a spot on the healthcare proxy form to put the alternate in in case the first person is unwilling or unable. As I said earlier, we're always trying to do a little planning here. If something happens to A, then I want B. If not B, then C. You must be at least 18 years of age or older to do a healthcare proxy, um, to, fill, to fill one out, and to witness and sign it. Hmm? The proxy is very simple. All it requires is your signature and two witnesses. That's all. Your signature, two witnesses to the healthcare proxy form. Now, who do you give that proxy to? All right? You really let the person know, the person you've named as your proxy, let them know where that form is. All right? Let them know where all these forms are, just in case they need to get their hands on them. Hmm? Very, very important. And lastly, to back up that healthcare proxy, a document called a living will. All right? You may be living well and not have a living will. The word I use to describe a living will is simply a backup document. Who does it back up? It backs up the person with the health care proxy. As we said previously, the person you named as your health care proxy, you've already given them the authority to withhold life-sustaining treatment from you. The living will is simply your decision. You feel that strongly about it to say, furthermore, I, it's my decision, I do not want to be kept alive on life support systems. So if you feel that strongly about the document, execute a living will. Now, people have said to me, Mr. Roach, if I had to have one or the other of these documents, which one should I have? By all means, have the healthcare proxy. You want to nail it down, leave nothing to doubt, have yourself a living will. All right? And oddly enough, and I always want to mention this. Oddly enough, all the law 
in this area of right to die has not been made by old older people. It's been made by young women. People like Karen Ann Quinlan, Nancy Cruzan, Terry Chabot. Mm -hmm. So as we age, these documents become very, very important as planning tools. And I would trust and hope that you get out there, see your attorneys, and get these done as soon as possible. Thank you.